The Pharisees then criticized this. So maybe the question is, which are we more like? They invite, he, Jesus, Matthew invites his sinful friends over, and the Pharisees and the, and the teachers of the law see this, and they think, what, they ask Jesus' disciples, what is your master doing? No self-respecting rabbi, religious person, leader, would be caught dead at a party like this. Why is he doing that? Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now you might think, well, what's the big deal, eating with people? In the ancient culture, who you sat down with, who you ate with, was a very intimate thing. Part of it was just a cultural symbol of acceptance. But, but it, there's also some practical applications to this. They would eat, and this is true in Middle Eastern culture still today, and dip by dipping in a common bowl. A shared bowl together and breaking off pieces of bread, dipping in the bowl together. So you're, there's, an intimate, there's an intimate interaction with somebody you're eating with in the ancient world. They didn't eat sitting up at tables like in chairs like we do. They ate reclining on cushions and a low table in front of them. So you're, you're reclining. Remember in, this, in this, uh, the, the Last Supper story, Jesus says the one who reclined, John says the one who reclined at Jesus' breast? You kind of wonder, well, what, what kind of a dinner party is that where you sit in a chair and some guy like lays in his lap? That's weird. What was he doing? It's because they'd be leaning on their right elbow with their feet stretched out behind them, dipping the food. And so if I'm leaning this way and you're there, I'm, I am kind of leaning into you. That's, this was a very intimate setting. So the people you did this with were those that were, you accepted, those you identified with, those you said, we're together. I'm one of you. You can be with me. So when the tax collector, when the Pharisees see this, they think, what are you doing? You're communicating something you ought not to be communicating. And... This goes back to a principle you learned when, we talked, when Pastor Brian talked about the leper. Jesus cleanses the leper, and the, and the touch of Jesus comes before the, the, the healing. Do you remember that? He touches him before he pronounces him clean. He didn't have to do it that way. And, and I'm sure Pastor Brian talked about this, that in all of the rest of human society, when the unclean thing, the contaminated sick thing, touches the clean or healthy thing, what happens? Right, why do we put Purell over our hand? My, my, my wife, when our first child was born, and he was born premature and stayed in the hospital for Noah. He's 23 now and doing fine, but he was four pounds, four ounces, and had all kinds of respiratory issues. And she, I woke up one night, uh, and I had, I had a cold, a slight cold, and I was coughing, and I felt like there was, like a, there was raining. It was like a mist falling on me. And I woke up the other night, my wife was spraying Lysol over my head and was falling down on me like this. Because I had been coughing in my sleep, and Noah was like in the bassinet on the other side of the bed. I'm like, you know, we're paranoid about germs, right? Wiping everything down constantly by the third child. It's like, ah, he'll be fine, right? But why do we do this? Because germs contaminate, germs infect, right? The unclean thing makes the clean thing unclean. That works every, think of the coronavirus. What's happening in China right now is terrifying. They're quarantining off however many million people in these cities. Why? They got to contain that so it doesn't spread. It doesn't work that way with a gospel. With the gospel, spiritually speaking, when it comes to Jesus, he's cleanness. He's the clean thing. And it, he cannot be contaminated. So he can sit with whoever he wants to sit with. Because he can't be contaminated. But if you encounter him, he makes you, the unclean thing, clean by his grace. It's so amazing. So he's at this table with these people, and he can't be infected. He can't be made unclean, defiled, to use the Jewish term. Because he's the essence of what it means to be clean, to be right with God. In fact, he wants to clean them. He wants to make them right with God. Same with us. So who does he go to? Anyone and everyone. He doesn't, God doesn't divide the world that way. Doesn't see people that way. And this is why they look at him and he says, what's he doing? Not only is he setting a bad example, he's putting himself at risk. They just don't understand who he is. And the last thing, Jesus confronts the greater sin. Jesus confronts the greater sin. On hearing this, verse 12, Jesus said, and this, this is so like Jesus. In a sentence or a statement, he just drives right to the heart. There's so much packed in this little sentence. He says, on hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So what's 
this response, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. On the face of it, that sounds fairly obvious, right? You don't go to the hospital if, you don't, if you're not sick. What's he talking about? Who are the healthy and the sick in God's view? Not the healthy don't need a doctor. Now, the, t- the, the, the wrong way to read this would be for the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, to think, well, we're the healthy ones. He's saying we don't need a doctor because we're the healthy ones. So that's why he's going to these poor sick people. It'd be easy for them to assume. That's not what he's saying. Who are the healthy ones? Well, he hints at it by this last statement. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Let me try to unpack it by taking you to another dinner party Jesus was once at in Luke chapter 7. We won't be on the screen. It is in your Bible. You can jot it down and read it later. It's one of my favorite encounters in all the Gospels. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus is invited to dinner by a man named Simon. Not Simon who becomes Peter, but Simon who was a Pharisee, a religious leader, one of the, leader, one of the elders' leaders in the, in the community. And he has them over for dinner with a bunch of other respectable people. So it's the opposite of this dinner party with Matthew. All the bright, shiny religious people are there. All the, the well-respected leaders in the community are at this dinner party. And they're eating together. And a woman comes in. Perhaps you might remember the story now if you haven't read it before. A woman enters. A woman of ill repute, the old King James says. A woman who's known for her immoral lifestyle. Whether or not she was a prostitute, we're not certain. But she was known in the town for getting around. And she comes in to the meal. And she comes to Jesus' feet. Now she's not under the table, remember. She's, he's stretched, he's leaning on his elbow, stretched out, and she's behind him. Who knows, remembers what she begins to do? Weep so much that her tears fall on Jesus' feet. And then she wipes his feet with her hair. This is in contrast to when Jesus comes into Simon's house, the text tells us, Simon does not greet him with a kiss. Simon does not anoint his head with oil. Simon does not wash his feet or have his feet washed. These are not oversights. These are intentional slights. Simon is intending to snub Jesus. He insults him by what he doesn't do for him greeting. Jesus is at the table and having these things done by this woman. She pours out a perfume, the tools of her trade, if you will, on Jesus. And Simon is watching this happen and judging Jesus in his heart, saying, I knew it. I knew he's not the real deal. Because if he was, he would never let her touch him. And Jesus answers his thoughts, which is awesome. And he says, Simon, I have something to tell you. And Jesus says, tell me, teacher. You can almost hear the bite in this. He doesn't think he's a real teacher at all. And Jesus tells this parable. This is why I brought up this story. He tells a parable called the parable of the two debtors. It's a fascinating little parable. He says, two men owed money to a certain money lender. Now, in the ancient Middle Eastern culture, Jewish culture, to get into debt, you were kind of considered foolish and, and beneath the, the uh, intelligent person. You sh- shouldn't get yourself into debt. And if you, if you were the person who lent at interest, you were even worse. So these are, these are two, two gamblers getting over the head to a bookie, right? I mean, this is not, these are not people to be thought highly of. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed 50 denarii, and a denarii is a day's day's wage. One owed 50 days wages, one owed 500 days wages. Neither one could pay him back. So he canceled the debt of both of them. Now, which one will love him more? Simon says, I suppose. He doesn't even want to answer because he knows where this is going. (laughs) I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. Jesus says, Give the boy a cigar. He doesn't say that. (laughs) He says, you have judged correctly. You've answered right. And then he says, do you see this woman? Turning to the woman, do you see this woman? And he says, she loves much because she's been forgiven much. So let's go back to Jesus' question. Who are the healthy and who are the sick? It's not the healthy who need a doctor. Here's the the answer. Use the debtors. Simon, which one will love Jesus, love, love the, debt, the, the money lender more? The one with the bigger debt canceled. Okay, in God's economy, who are the big debtors and who are the small debtors? Who owes God a little bit of grace, just a little forgiveness, and who needs a lot of grace? Which one are you? Here's the truth. In God's economy, there are no small debtors. Why? What do those two men have in common? 
What do the two guys, the two debtors have in common? They can't pay. This is so profound. I know it's simple, but the most simple things are. Neither one could pay. What does it matter if you owe 50, 500, or 5 million? If you can't pay, you can't pay. Here's Simon's problem, the Pharisee. He thinks he only owes a little. I mean, I'm not perfect. I would never say that. But I'm much better than her and most of these people. And I only need a little grace. I mean, of course I need some grace. Nobody's perfect, but I'm not like them. He sees himself as a small debtor. And he's wrong. And therefore he's sick. He's not healthy. There are no healthy people. There are only those who know they're sick. And then they can come to the great physician, Jesus. And this is such an issue, I think, in the, for, for, for many of us. And I'm not, I'm not saying that we would consciously say this. But we, we live in an affluent society. We come to a good, nice church where everybody kind of looks like they have their act together. We, we see the bright, shiny families, and we go do some service, and we give a little bit, and we come to things like this, like team, we feel good about ourselves, and we think, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. All the while, there might be a sickness growing in us because we've never come to Jesus and said, I, I owe more than I can pay. I'm sick to the soul. I've got no hope of cleaning up my act or paying my debt unless you do it. Those are the only healthy people. Those are the righteous people. Those are the ones who get it. So there are no small debtors, just those who think they are. There are no healthy people, just those who think they are, which is Jesus' whole point here. They say, what are you doing eating with them? And Jesus is saying, why aren't you at this table? Don't you see you're just like them? Don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I long to do for you? Well, here's another question. Why does Jesus tell that story of the, of the two debtors in Luke 7? Does he tell it to, to like put Simon in his place? To prove him to be a self-righteous, arrogant idiot? Is that why he tells the story? No, he tells it because he loves him. Same as he loves that woman. Same as he loves Matthew. Same as he loves Matthew's friends. Same as he loves you. He tells the story to break through Simon's hard heart, to get to him, because he loves him. There are no healthy people, just those who know they're sick, and they, therefore they can come to Jesus to be made well. That's, I think, the whole point here. Jesus calls this man, and this man's first reaction is, I, I know people who need to know this guy. I know people who need to meet the one who can make them well. That should convict you. It convicts me. Do you know people who need to know Jesus? Do you need to know him? Not know about him. Not know some more facts about, from the Bible, but know him. And if you know him, if you've met him, do you know people in your life who desperately need, more than they need a new job, more than they need to have their marriage reconciled, more than they need to be restored to their kids, more than, they need to, more than anything else, and those are real needs, what they need more than anything else is to know the one who can make them well, to know the one who can forgive sin, to call them into a whole new life. This is what Jesus is about. That's what, he, that's what he wants more than anything else. And so I, I'll put the question to us. There's some other questions on your list there for you. First question, who do you identify with more? Matthew and his tax collecting, quote unquote, sinful friends? Or with the very religious Pharisees? Those who see the world in us and them? And when it comes to influence, when you're with your friends who don't believe the way you believe, do you influence them or do they influence you? When's the last time you felt a deep, like, like, like a deep passion and desire for someone you care about to know Jesus? Sometimes, if I'm honest, I slip into thinking, well, it's typical they would respond that way because they, they don't believe. Uh, I should expect that coming from him or her. Instead of, oh, I want them to know how much God loves them. I want them to know how much he desires to meet them and invite them to his table. Let me pray for you uh, and then send you to your tables to discuss. Father God, you are the great physician. You make us healthy and well and sometimes we fall into the trap of thinking we don't need that or we just need a little. Thank you for the reminder here this morning, even before we go to discussion and prayer, that we are all Sick, spiritually speaking. None of us can pay the debt of sin we owe. But you are a good and gracious God and you love us enough to come find us even when we're at our tax collecting booth sitting there in our own mess. 
to call us your sons, to bring us in, onto your side, onto your team, to forgive our sin, to give us new identity. And then to use us to share that same love with our friends. We thank you in your name. Amen. Let's grab another cup of coffee, have some time around your tables for these questions, and we'll wrap up in a few minutes.